Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Share my screen. Okay, so welcome everyone to tonight's program, uh, Creative Talk, The Power of Collaboration. Uh, my name is Hedda, and I'm a library assistant at Phoenix Public Library, and I'm part of the Startup Phoenix team, uh, which provides resources and support for entrepreneurs. Uh, this is the second panel discussion in a three part series uh, where we're exploring topics specific to creative entrepreneurs. Each session uh, features a unique set of panel members uh, representing diverse creative fields. Uh, first, I'd like to go over a few things in uh, WebEx to help you navigate. You'll see uh, the buttons on the bottom of your screen if you need to uh, mute yourself or use the chat feature. Um, you can also raise your hand if you would like to be unmuted to speak. Um, you can also use emojis if you see fit. Uh, if you're having audio issues, uh, your speaker volume may be too low, um, so be sure to adjust your speaker settings and ensure um, that your audio device is properly and securely plugged in. If you still can't hear, uh, use your phone to call in for audio. Uh, there's an option down below um, on WebEx, um, and you should also have received the call-in number um, through the registration. And just to let you know, uh, we have a couple of more programs um, coming up this month uh, for creative entrepreneurs. Uh, next week on Wednesday is Doing Business in Phoenix, uh, and that will be with the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture, and the same time, just on Wednesday. And two weeks from now, we have our last program in the series of Creative Talk, and that is going to be Being Your Own Boss. So be sure to go online and register for those and see what other offerings we have. Okay, and I'll go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists. I'm going to start with Abby Zufelt. Uh, she is a digital marketing strategist, podcast host, blogger, and speaker. She is passionate about education and sharing inspiring stories, which led her to a career in digital media. Along with her day job as the director of the Concrete Schools Digital Audiences Lab, Abby is the podcast host of Working Girl Talk, a podcast that covers the latest business and tech news, career advice, and features interviews with inspiring businesswomen. And next we have Bobby Zokaitis. I think I said that right, Bobby. <laughs> He's a sculptor who creates large scale, colorful, interactive objects and spaces which engage the audience's sense of play and imagination. He works with metals, woods, and other industrial materials, and often sews and weaves with lighter materials like fabric, rope, and paracord. Bobby has recently produced public artwork for spaces across the U.S. that reimagine the relationships between viewer, artist, artwork, and space. Next, we have Diana Calderon. She is an inter interdisciplinary artist, mentor, educator, and creative leader born in Chihuahua, Mexico, raised in the borderland of El Paso, Texas, currently living and working in Phoenix. Her art blends traditional and contemporary techniques, such as relief printmaking, bookmaking, sculptural installation, public and performance art. Calderon is an alum of AmeriCorps National Service, the National Association of Latino Arts Culture Leadership Institute, and holds 15 plus years of diverse experience in the arts, education, administration, and community engagement. And we also have Joan Barron. She's an environmental activist, artist, and educator whose work includes ceramics, mosaics, edible landscapes, and public art installations across the valley. She has maintained a studio in South Scottsdale for over 20 years, where she produces original handmade ceramic vessels and wares, along with offering small group workshops and tours. 
Her studio actively works with architects, designers, homeowners, and community leaders to bring their projects to life and spark awareness about urban sustainability. So welcome panel members. So grateful that you're here with us this evening. And before we dive into our discussion tonight of collaboration, um, I'd like you each to share with us some current projects you have going or something recent you completed or even something in the future um, that you will be working on. Um, Abby, could we start with you? Yeah, hi, this is so fantastic. Thank you for having me and I'm so excited to be here. So a current project as a podcast host, I recently made the switch to doing a seasonal show. I used to do every single Friday for three years and um, I'm currently getting my master's degree and I was like, you know what, I need to kind of switch this up to still be in service of my audience, but also have something a little bit more manageable too, so I can manage content a little bit better. So currently I'm ramping up the upcoming season. I have all of these interviews saved. I'm editing right now, and I'm really excited about the launch of the newest season um, at the end of April. So that's what I'm really excited about. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, I'm Bobby. Hi, um, I'm Bobby. Uh, one of the, the, I guess the project that I'm currently working on is actually I've got the project room at the Mesa Art Center um, for the summer exhibitions. Uh, it opens May 12th. Um, you can see work behind me. No one's seen this yet, so don't oh. tell anybody you've seen it. <laughs> and there's another one over here, wait, somewhere. And then all the small things on the mantle. Um, it's been three years building that, that work. Um, so I'm pretty excited to have it sort of have a re resolution. Um, anyway, May 12th, uh, Mesa Art Center. Awesome. Check it out. Yeah. Thank you. And Diana? Okay, well, I can talk about a recent project um, for the ArtLink um, annual gala event. Just, uh, I collaborated with Lauren Lee and we um, did an interactive installation that included installation, painting, and printmaking. Printmaking was new to my collaborator. And what is still going on from that are some prints. Prints are available um, in her website or mine or our social media. That's all. Wonderful, thank you. And Joan? Oh, let me unmute you, Joan. Sorry. There you go. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, I'll pick a recent project as well. Uh, it was um, uh, titled Meditations for the Salt River, and it was a collaboration with uh, Lindsay Rothrock for the Artland Gala um, as well. And um, this was uh, us uh, exploring the technique of cyanotype, which both of us had wanted to um, dig deeper into. It was a perfect opportunity. So um, the uh, the series that I created uh, using clay, um, uh, I've worked with the symbol of the hand or the hamsa for, gosh, probably over 30 years now. Um, the series was titled A River Runs Through Me. Um, and on many of the pieces of clay, I used the cyanotype um, with some really cool results. So it was really quite exciting. Very cool. Well, thank you. And just to let our at attendees know, um, if you have a question, um, you can put it in the chat um, and we'll definitely incorporate it um, into our talk. Um, you can also mute yourself or raise your hand um, if you'd like to speak your question, and we can definitely uh, let you go ahead and do that. Um, so to get started, um, I wanted to ask you all, what is your typical relationship with collaboration? Is it pretty varied? Um, do you collaborate often? Um, just what's the typical overview in your practice? Um, I guess I can go 
first. Um, I've been collaborating for over 15 years in the arts. Um, I could say 20 years if I include service projects, but I don't think that counts so much as collaborations. Um, but if it wasn't for a base in service projects, I don't think I would be as uh, long distance, enduring collaborator per se. Um, I like it. I like working with people. Um, I've worked with strangers and I've worked with friends and I've worked with, I guess, people who I'm familiar with, people who I don't know what I'm going to get, such as uh, community members or um, students, you know, you just, it, to me, it is kind of a thrill that you don't know what you're going to get. Um, and there, it requires a lot of flexibility um, and you just hope that everyone can lift their, their load and sometimes help with other loads. Um, I don't know if I'm being too ambiguous or vague, but um, I've yeah, collaborated from hand painted tile murals to regular murals to um, installation projects or, you know, teaching. So overall, um, my scope is just be open. Yeah, sounds like a wide variety. Yeah, I'll throw in a few thoughts. Um, yeah, I love collaborating. I I think for me, the, the thing that um, I recognize and I love being um, uh, playing the role is helping to bring out the creativity in other people. Um, people are really starving for connection. And I think in the arts, we have this opportunity to bring people together and explore different materials together. And there's there is surprised as um, as I am at the results every time. It's just uh, a very enlightening, inspiring uh, situation. And that, that could be, um, I think you showed an image of one of my public art projects um, earlier. That was Thompson Peak Parkway. And that was a project that, um, you know, ran, oh, close to three years. Um, and there were many community workshops involved in that. And the idea there were, uh, was for people of all ages to come together during these uh, setup times and to bring uh, mementos of things that they held on to dearly that were either given to them or something they found. And then we would embed it into the wet clay and store it as a memory. So that wall that you showed the images of those um, hands are holding uh, hundreds of memory for people. Um, and now they're permanently installed inside the rammed earth walls on the parkway. Awesome, thank you. I guess I can answer it in a slight, uh, my question in a slightly different way. Uh, <clears throat> I feel like there's the collaboration with the community, which is an absolute must in public art, uh, because unlike fine art, uh, you're trying to give the community an expression you're trying. So there's a lot of listening when you're talking to the community. But then there's a uh, sort of material expertise and procedural expertise where you're relying on engineers and project managers uh, and craftspeople to sort of execute a vision. And then like at every moment, when you're discussing uh, working with those people, um, they generally also have great ideas. Um, and you can learn a lot uh, and the project can uh, actually get a lot of strength from that, that process. And I'll add that my typical relationship with collaboration is in a few different areas. So with putting out a podcast, it's very much an output action. So one would think, oh, maybe there's not a lot of collaboration in that, but Really, when I notice when I'm most successful, it's when I am collaborating with my audience and maybe they don't even realize that. So it's me taking their feedback, looking at the numbers. Uh, oh, this episode resonated more. That's almost a collaborative effort of 
feedback of, oh, more episodes like that. So even more in like a, in a more personal sense, like any DMs I get on social media, Instagram, for example, like, hey, do you have an episode about this? Or, oh, could you interview this person? I'm always open to that feedback. And to me, I look at that as a collaboration with my audience almost, where I'm kind of leading the show here, but really open to how it can go forward because I'm there to serve them. Um, and then as a professor at ASU, working with students all the time, I feel like like my role there in collaboration is really to help lift them to collaborate with each other and then with the clients that they're working with since it is more of an agency model uh, within the school. Wonderful. Thank you all. And I know um, a few of you shared specific examples of a collaborative project, um, but is there a specific kind of favorite project you could share with all of us that, that you worked on that kind of stands out in your mind? So I did a project that we finished up uh, the first year of the pandemic. Um, it's on the west side in Maryville. It's called a time machine called Tinaha, um, which is a water well site um, refurbishment uh, and beautification project that's on 73rd Avenue and Crittenden Lane, which is right between Trevor G. Brown High School and Estrella Middle School. Um, and so the workshops, we went into the high school to talk to them about the site and like there's pragmatic issues, like it was just pea gravel, so it was very hot. Um, there wasn't a traffic light, so it was very dark. Um, so there's that kind of information and feedback. Um, but the most interesting one really was that when the high schoolers were talking about walking to the middle school um, for to pick up their kids siblings, they talked about this idea of nostalgia. Right as they were going back to middle school, and so that's where we came up with this idea of a time machine. Um, and so the whole site is actually planted. Uh, the plantings, the landscape architecture, the plantings go from a contemporary urban park, right, with lots of trees, shade trees, grasses, uh, back through the farmlands through decorative uh, uh, cactus rows into natural desert plantings. And so as you walk through the site. Uh, and then my, well, my sculpture has this, it's sort of this uh, ocular kind of uh, gateway, right? So as you walk through the site, you can pass through the history of Phoenix. Um, and that one is actually one of my favorites, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Oh, Joan, I think, let me unmute you. I think, uh, there you go. Okay, thanks. Um, I think um, I'll uh, I'll share uh, projects that I do in the parks. Um, of course, I love being outdoors, so parks are perfect, and they're community driven. Um, and uh, I did one most recently in Meyer Park in Tempe. Um, another one in Hudson. It's called Hudson Manor in Tempe and then a uh, Rover Elementary School in Tempe. And um, these are all outdoor projects. And I, I think the Rover one is really interesting because the uh, children um, in this uh, mixed media mural, um, they, they were learning what it really means to live in the desert and who are their cousins, the animals who, uh, what, what cactus grow there, what kind of food those uh, plants and succulents can provide to them and to help them understand really how special where they live is. And they're able to uh, use that as a, a, a learning space now. So they're studying science and biology and writing and sitting outside uh, looking at the mural and writing poetry now. So they're able to fulfill their curriculum requirements in a really unique way. And that's always been one of my big pushes is to get the kids outdoors more. And so uh, creating murals that are combine an educational component 
along with being beautiful and colorful and exciting and um, something that year round they can be learning from and their teachers as well. Getting the teachers to be more comfortable coming outdoors. Uh, the kids do so much better in school. This school went from a C minus to an A rating in just less than two years. And we attribute it to getting them outdoors more. That's awesome. Um, I'll throw out a kind of an unconventional collaboration, but a, a recent favorite. Um, so in January, I flew out to New York because my podcast won an award. And while I was there, I didn't even think of an idea to record an episode. But while I was there, uh, one of my friends met up with me and I was like, you know what? Why don't we create while we're here? So the collaboration was very fast. It was, okay, let's find a studio. Let's figure out what time we could do this in our short window of while we're here. So it came together. I found a studio, found people to produce and record and all of these things. And it was very off the cuff, but it's one of my favorite collaborations, collaborating with my friend and also these professionals in New York. And it was just so random. And I think my, my biggest takeaway from that was kind of embracing the spontaneity with collaboration too. And maybe look in areas like I never thought like, oh, I'm going to record an episode and create uh, my art in New York. But I was like, you know what, let's just dive into this and see if we can make it happen. And if it, and if I couldn't have made that collaboration happen, like no worries, but I did and it turned out really great. So I think my big takeaway and why it was such a favorite of mine recently is just because it was so spontaneous and really just leaned into that. So thank you. Um, all right, well, I have two recent impactful collaborations, but I'll try to um, cut it. So one of the- no, take your time. <laughs> so it you know hearing the rest of you speak about your collaborations um one one of the recent impactful ones was collaborating with um the mccain institute one in ten youth um another artist friend martin moreno and chico art and culture organization um to create a digital mural for the real campaign which is to raise awareness around online safety in today's digital world um so we had uh uh the collaboration was to create workshops to teach the kids or youth how to create a mural and what the process entails uh we ended up with a digital mural and um started with the description of what a visual composition looks like and some of the um some of the teens spoke about making something positive of negativity or toxicity um, or breaking free growing in education seeking wisdom and mentors in order to change their social battery not change charge to charge their social batteries since it could be so draining. Um, so they spoke of restoring energy and uh, by doing what they love. So some of the images that they chose was really sweet. Um, they chose, for example, plants and flowers um, to represent growth and healing. Some There were some wings to represent freedom, a compass to show direction, book, to represent education and knowledge and um, stained glass for restoration. So that was a pretty impactful collaboration because I, I could see the students or the kids or the teens that had never done art before and they're um, paying attention to, to the artists, the collaborators work and um, really trying their best to put in their, um, you know, their best work or their best effort, even though some of them were vocally intimidated in creating something that they never had. But, you know, seeing their faces at the end and to see what we created as a whole is priceless. Um, so that's one of the recent impactful collaborations with youth. Um, I've done a ton of collaborations with youth and that's my favorite thing is to see their faces at the end to, you know, to see how they created something they never thought. It's just like, you don't know what, what is gonna turn out. So be surprised to surprise yourself is what I, what I love 
Um, I guess another impactful collaboration was this. This is really in the non artistic is collaborating with teachers at a middle school to pick up the letter grade. Like John mentioned, um, this was an underperforming school. I collaborated with the teachers and uh, we didn't have an art program, but um, I owe it to being open to collaborate, meeting people where they're at, like the teachers and the students, encouraging them and building relationships. Um, like I would play volleyball with the students at lunch, um, forget that I even have lunch. And we were able to pick up the grade from a C to almost an A, and that was the highest ever in the history of the school, which is um, in proficiency and growth, the highest score. Um, forgot to mention I was the principal. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah, that was my a very impactful first year principal collaboration that I even surprised myself with, but um, most of all the kids, middle schoolers did an incredible job. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and this next question, it may or may not apply to your personal creative process, um, but in your practice, um, are there different stages that you prefer to invite feedback or collaboration and other times where you would prefer to just work independently? Um, and that could be, you know, in the planning stages or in sharing it with an audience, if you prefer that, you know, do you like to kind of keep some things, you know, just private and personal, you know, until you're ready to share that and collaborate with others. I guess I can quickly say that the only time that I've been an independent non collaborator is when I've done certain performance art pieces that are very personal to my journey. So, um, that's my own time that I'm like this it's not a collaborative piece, so just performance art. Oh, Joe. I, am I unmuted? No, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> So I, I guess uh, for me, I, I have a pretty um, pretty intense studio practice, and for me, I need that time um, alone um, to really give myself a chance to collaborate with myself and see where that takes me. If you don't allow yourself that that you know uh, precious time, and it is really precious. I mean, the time. It, it's just going so fast um, that uh, I think you you miss out on a lot of opportunity. And then as that gets developed, then it's exciting to want to share it with other people. Um, for example, I'll, I'll go one Saturday every month and set up a, a space at the downtown Phoenix Farmers Market because of my my passion and love for growing food and teaching other people how to grow food in small spaces, especially, um, it's perfect for me to be in that uh, environment with with farmers and uh, people that are doing beautiful things, making beautiful breads and um, growing amazing fruits and vegetables, uh, working with their hands in that way. And I'm working with clay and many of my vessels then are used to serve or uh, preserve the foods um, that they are making. Um, a good example would be um, the salt cellars that I make. So the people that are making specialty salts or sugar blends, um, they can have that sitting out and it. it's a, a original uh, vessel instead of some plastic object that as soon as the right the salt or the pepper is done you throw the the container away um uh, you can't even open them 
because they're designed that you have to throw them away. So, um, and then uh, tied in with that is also that um, I think it's uh, worth sharing is that a, a few years back, I um, I started what's called the mercantile. And um, I, I just love the concept of the mercantile The you know, it has a, a, a fabulous history, but the idea for me is really about recognizing that everyone has a skill that has value. And I think that the more we can engage in that conversation and bring out the, uh, the worth of each individual person, it gives them a sense of belonging. And I, I think, especially with the pandemic where we were all separated, um, it was very challenging for, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, I, I think artists may have had the advantage there because we have something that we can do, occupy our time, right? But um, so it's, um, it's really an important aspect because I believe that trading your skill for a skill is something that we don't really talk about enough and offer that out as an opportunity enough. Uh, so that's what the mercantile is looking at. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, for my side, Diana, I really resonated with what you, what you said when it's about your own personal journey. I feel like definitely it's like, I'm doing it no matter what. <laughs> and maybe I don't need to have the feedback of others right away until it's out there. Um, so I really get get re resonate with that. And I think as a creator, maybe that's probably one of the most important things, like when it is time to hey, this is me in my creative zone versus like a feedback moment or a collaborative moment. Um, so I think for me, it's always just kind of depending on the project, but usually I do kind of have a vision for what I want and maybe I'll invite feedback. But for me, it's really important for collaborations to just make sure that that collaboration, that feedback is really with the right people for sure. Um, so yeah, as a creator, I think it's always gonna be a little bit different. I also think it varies a lot. Um, one of the one of my interesting factoids about my life is I'm a twin, yeah. right? So I didn't um, even get to be birthed by myself. Um, but <laughs> it's uh, I, I uh, my first uh, job was at a sculpture park in northern Minnesota where we were an arts residency, and my job was to facilitate everybody's work, and we were making giant stuff. Um, and it took everybody. Um, you pull out a crane, you need four people. You know, uh, I have built my own crane in the backyard here uh, so that I can do that stuff by myself. Um, and with untrained people, I very much prefer to do that stuff by myself. But it's super fun to go back to the guys that I was doing with that with like 15 years ago and get a crane and a whole bunch of steel that you don't uh that isn't precious and just freestyle a thing uh, and that's very uncommon um as far as a form of collaboration and a form of like even creative pursuit um i think the statistic actually is most of us get 20 percent in the studio by ourselves um and it doesn't really mat matter if uh you're selling coffee to get your free time or if your name is tom Sachs. It still boils down to about a 20% of your time solo in the studio. Um, and I, you know, if I get that, I think I'd be lucky. Uh, but, you know, do what you can, I guess. Thank you. And uh, in the creative, um, like when you're working on a creative project, um, do you find it's difficult to kind of stay true to your own creative vision or do you just have to let that go? Um, so kind of just talking about, you know, the balance of incorporating your own vision with someone else's, can that be challenging or do you just kind of let it go and, and see what happens? Like some have mentioned. Yeah, Bobby. So this one's interesting. Um... I learned a lot of solutions, like aesthetic solutions to aesthetic problems in the field, right? And those are field solutions. Whereas a lot of when you're talking about these large projects and there's so much planning, um, have, we've gone to a digital solution, 
right? Which is a very like fundamentally a different aesthetic, right? You can actually horizontal lines or horizontal all the way across, no matter what, you know, you're using a GPS system to survey sites, you know, so you can get across a 400 foot run. You can have foreknowledge of an eight inch difference. Um, and that's a hard thing, right? To combat or to try to reconcile what would be a field solution and a handmade mark with what is a digital uh, design solution and is a digital mark. I find that um, an incredibly precarious balance uh, to be on as far as a teeter totter. Um, I like the handmade, the field solution way better than the design solution, but sometimes that's just impossible. And it's definitely not cost effective. Anyway. And any other insight? Oh, Dan. Um, yeah, I guess uh, it just depends um, on the on the final product of the project. If you're hired to, so if you're hired to create a thing versus if it's your project, um, some projects give you freedom to or flexibility to, you know go with the flow per se, but some projects want this done a certain way. So you can't go astray very far from, from the final product. Um, I do know that things will not go according to plan sometimes. So um, I keep in mind in collaborations that I signed up for this and that I need to um, learn to be ready, have a backup plan or have a good attitude not just a plan, but maybe several and, you know, learn how to take the back seat sometimes or how to take lead. Um, I also like to, depending on who I'm working with, allow others to take leadership if they don't have experience. So if I know I've already done this 10 times, you know what, I'm going to let you go ahead and take this lead. Um, and maybe I can try something else that I haven't, but that's me. I, I, I like challenges and I like uh, creative problem solving and, you know, making the best of it. But, you know, I go in knowing that I signed up for this and that's how it is. Thank you. Yeah, I can relate to that a hundred percent. So, and, and that usually happens for me in the larger public art projects because you uh, you're depending so much on uh, the you know the technical knowledge of of others and your idea uh, as great as and exciting as it looks on paper uh, or even in your model when you get out out there um, to translate something on eight and a half by eleven to uh, a mile long wall. It takes on all kinds of challenges, but um, uh, with a really good team, um, and you learn you learn to get along and uh, ha have fun doing it. So you you have to be um, you really have to be willing to be a team player and you know listen to others and consider it and and not jump to. Uh, uh, conclusions too quickly about um, that it's interfering with your idea because in the end, you know, their contributions could be just making it even better. Um, so uh, I've learned a lot over the years working in, in that capacity. So um, I second what everybody just said. There's always that balance of vision versus input and feedback. And I think it's starting with that expectation right from the start on what the vision, the mission of this project is. 
and then knowing that there's going to be innovative moments along the way that it might change course, but just being on the same page constantly with whoever partner you're working with. Um, and then, yeah, dependent on the project, maybe if it is something a little bit more that I'm leading or like very personal, then it's like, okay, this is the vision and we're going to stay the course with that. But if it is something more collaborative, just being open to those moments of innovation and new thoughts, but expectations, I think, are always something important to set from the start. Definitely. Thank you. And kind of along that line, um, has there ever been a project um, that you're working on where it was challenging to let your work be either completely disregarded or edited completely um, in the process? Um, or is there usually a give and take? Um, I'll throw out one example. Um, I did have a guest once that did uh, offer my podcast required me to send them the audio beforehand so they could comb through it, um, which that was new for me. So I, I did give them and their peer person the audio and there was just one thing they wanted to cut out, but it was a really big learning lesson for me to really like, again, setting those expectations from the start that this is a creative outlet and having trust in me as the host and creator to know that I would never have somebody on my show or if I didn't think you were going to be a great guest anyway, and then having the trust in me as a host and creator to like never let them be seen in a bad light or anything. Um, and if that was the case, then it, they wouldn't be a guest on the show. So that was just a big learning lesson for me to really, okay, like take that feedback, understand that that process can happen and how do I um, make sure I can maintain creative control because it is my show, but also be flexible to help and provide guidance and just get, build that trust, I guess, with my collaborative partners to know. Um, but yeah, it was a good learning lesson for me. And I think feedback is always super important, um, especially like, so that was kind of on the guest side and kind of navigating that. Um, and then feedback from my audience on the other end of it, just always like, hey, like, what did you think of this? And just really being receptive to that feedback, because I think it's super important to think of feedback as help. It's at least some most of the time, I think people are just trying to be helpful. And if it isn't something that's going to be helpful or constructive, maybe that's a different conversation. But I think I really try to to look at it through uh, help like what's like the positive here like is there something i could be doing better and trying to look at it through that lens but again expectations for sure kind of going back to that too i can uh, share a, a story that sort of um encapsulates what everyone said so far. Um, you know, when you come to a project and you've worked really hard on your drawing and your concept and you think you've really got something great, and then you, because it's a large public project, you're generally required to meet with the community where that project's going to be uh, placed. And in the case of a roadway, um, which this one project was going through, um, uh, I had to meet several times with the, the homeowners in that neighborhood and, um, they had a really hard time understanding the concept. Um, and so I had to let go of outcome and just, um, uh, really pay attention to what was going on for them. And once I did that and really gave them a chance to air what was concerning them, I realized that there were things that had nothing to do with the art elements themselves, but the change to the neighborhood. And for a lot of uh, people, change um, is neither positive or negative. It's just the idea of change just throws them for a loop. And so the tendency, as we all know, generally speaking, they're going to be fearful. Fear will enter in like, that. how could this be good? It's a change. You know, you're going to take down my block wall and have it open, the hillside opened um, and right up to the, right up to the parkway. 
um, and so explaining um, and helping them understand how much of an improvement and a sound abatement all the different landscape elements would be and the wall itself being a, a sound abatement uh, material uh, would actually improve all of the things that they were so fearful about. And um, so it it's uh, just learning how to, I think, be a good listener and give them uh, feedback that shows that you've really heard them instead of trying to ram your idea too soon um, in front of them. Thank you. It's, it's always interesting working with the communities. Um, listening is such an important part of it. Um, and you can have a neighbor who's very angry uh, and is just looking for attention and that's annoying. Right. <laughs> My my personal difficulty a lot in collaborative projects, uh, there's a there's a version of public art that has uh, exclusively uses federal funding. Um, and they actually do not let you be the designer and the manufacturer on those projects. Right? <clears throat> so, for me, it's difficult because the steel work that I do for, for myself and for my clients uh, is generally very expensive. Uh, other places because it's not common in contemporary steel work. Um, but then normally what I've done, I've been, I've got one project in Tempe that's like this, and I'm actually working on a project in Minnesota that's like this, where you can hold on, you figure out what that one piece is. In Minnesota, I'm doing a big tapestry, right? Architectural scale column tapestry. Uh, and we think we can write the specs where I get to actually still weave that that uh, component, but then we're shipping it to Minnesota, and they're going to uh, take a con they're going to take a rubber mold off of it and cast the column in concrete, and then actually duplicate that twenty four times across the entire project, right? And so for me, there's this like the fir the first project where they were said absolutely not you're you're not allowed to make it. Um, it was very frustrating, right? It took forever to figure out what it is. Same for Minnesota. It took, it's, I don't know, we're six months in. I got a meeting on Friday. I'll let you know how it goes. Uh, but uh, there's opportunity in that. If they, if they take away some of that control for, for you, from you, then like you can ex use that to explore uh, other media, other ideas, for sure. And um, I did want to ask you guys, and you've touched on it um, a few times, but collaborating um, with the community. Um, does anyone else have um, another example of where you've collaborated with the community, either in the planning or um, the end result? Um, I have a project, uh, maybe, I don't know, 10 years old. I collaborated with Las Artes de Maricopa, uh, program for youth that I worked at, uh, the City of Phoenix Parks and Rec, uh, two local schools, and to create a mural at Cielito Park in Maryvale, and, oh, and a neighborhood block watch. And we had several community meetings to um, figure out a design and we had the kids at the school, um, you know, dropped up some some visuals, make some drawings, and we ended up compiling the best images and creating creating one image out of that. But um, I, I remember that the meetings with the community were difficult. They were challenging. The block watch, the neighborhood block watch, was. Um, I wouldn't say easy to work with, and I couldn't figure out why they weren't, um, I guess, in the same attitude of excitement as I was and the kids to create this beautiful mural at a park where there was high crime and a lot of 
uh, people sleeping there. So, um, yeah, I guess you just learn that the community is really invested in their neighborhoods and the well-being, and ultimately they want what's best for their community. And, you know, as Joan mentioned before, it's just listening sometimes to to see how we can work together and we want the same things at the end, which is the well-being of the community. I can share a, a project uh, that really incorporated uh, the neighborhood um, in Tempe Hudson Manor and Part of that project, um, I had this idea to create these um, photographic tiles and they would be um, portraits of families. And I, I was fortunate that there was a, um, uh, one of the homeowners in the neighborhood there was a professional photographer and she offered to take the, the uh, photographs. And so what was really cool about that project was that we created this, um, this uh, sign up list and uh, you would schedule a time that we would come over to your home. Your job was to gather as many of your family members and could be including your pets, which many people had, which was really cool. And we would do a, a a portrait of you and that would get transferred to the tile and then the tile ended up in the in the mosaic um, on these standpipes in the neighborhood and what was so interesting and cool about it was that so many of the members of the neighborhood had didn't know their neighbor um, and they got to meet them through the course of the uh, presentation of these three standpipes and um, seeing us out in the neighborhood, photographing and talking, meeting everyone and, uh, you know, oh yeah, we're going right next door. Do you know uh, Sam and Judy? And I said, no, we don't know, you know. And so that was really cool. You know, the neighborhood became closer and, um, you know, more, uh, it, it, the, the evolution of that meant that it would be a safer neighborhood because now people had a sense of, you know, an ex extended family, if you will. And I really like that aspect of um, public art, if it can contribute in that way. Um, I think it's a bonus for sure. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else wanna chime in on that one? I had a unique experience in Maui last year um, where I worked with a, uh, a group called Small Town Big Art. Uh, and they had, uh, Kelly, the CEO, had gotten um, our town money from the NEA. Um, and her mission was to bring in artists um, from outside of the community to do basically portraits of the community not portraits of community members, but to go immerse yourself in Wailuku town, which is uh, the seat of Maui. And uh, she organized workshops with different practitioners who were there. Um, so I got to, I got the, uh, I got a tour of the native uh, ancestral burial grounds from the last uh, surviving matriarch of Maui when Maui was before Hawaii. Um, I got uh, a tour of this gentleman who was rebuilding a koi pond on the beach, uh, which I, I guess is uh, unique in Polynesia to Hawaii. Right? Uh, we also, I got, uh, this woman took us up to the top of the mountain, um, who was doing the work to beat back the evasive species. Uh, her group was doing, um, work on specifically the top of the mountain. Which is like all knife edges, knife edges and stuff. And she was specifically trying to keep deers and pigs out of the rainforest, basically, uh, which is very hard to do because of the geography. So they, these people are like flying helicopters up the mountain, repelling out of the helicopters to lay fence line on these knife edges. Um, <laughs> I didn't get to do that. Super jealous. 
um, uh, you know, a tour of the uh, historical society, which is uh, crazy, uh, and the artifacts that they had were amazing. Um, and so that whole project, um, I went for a week and a half at the beginning of the project to immerse myself and get feedback and meet all of these people. And then I got to come back here and spend, spend three months, you know, I did design it and give them drawings and stuff and then uh, make it and we shipped it back out there and I got to go back out there uh, and re meet all of these people. Um, it was pretty much like I'm such a big uh, dork that like it was the perfect vacation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Even though it was, you know, it was 10 hours of meetings uh, between three people, three hours every day to get to know these people. Uh, but it was very different than the kind of community interaction that we've been discussing um, as far as like trying to go learn a neighborhood. Um, because normally, while there's lots of help from the administrators in organizing the meetings and stuff, generally like going to the community and helping with like a garbage cleanup day or going to a block party is way more beneficial than uh you know right now i'm working on a project on north 32nd street and uh, they're on the north side of north mountain and so like i was riding my mountain bike on north in the north mountain preserve like all winter uh, and going to the grocery stores is a very different thing than going to the block party where there's 100 people who want to complain about the airbnb is you know uh, and so it's it's interesting how you get that meaningful human connection uh, between individuals, you know. And there's there's like really no uh, there's no equation, right? Everybody's different. And um, and Abby, you had mentioned this a little bit with you know the end result, how there is collaboration or in you know uh, the receiving of your product or 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 the audience's interaction with it um so we've talked about some of the process um could you share with us examples of how you know the viewer interacts with your work once it's finished um is there any unique um stories you could share with us yeah yeah so i think something interesting uh which i think any creator can probably relate sometimes you feel like you're just putting stuff out into the void it's like okay hopefully people like this um but sometimes it's not easy to get that direct feedback it's like somebody really has to actually like take the time to either like comment contact you like hey this was really meaningful so i um really that that is always something really important and special to me when i do get reached out to from listeners like hey like which has happened multiple times which i'm always like oh like so proud of and uh it makes me feel like okay i'm doing something right then when i get messages and um emails or even just dms on instagram of hey i really needed to hear the episode that you put out today like thank you for doing that and I think for any creator, feedback like that is so meaningful. That is really what keeps me motivated and the creators that I know, and I'm assuming the creators here, like when you know like that your work is having an impact on people's lives, whether that's just like they felt something or whether they like took an action on something, that's always super special. So I think that direct feedback is so valuable. And even I always tell people like save those. Like I have a screenshot, like. Full, I have a folder on my phone, just an album of screenshots of feedback that I've gotten from people to kind of keep me going if I'm feeling down like, oh, am I even doing anything? Is this even worthwhile? Am I impacting people? I really reference back to that. It's like, okay, yes, yes, it is. So that's always good. So if you ever need motivation, like definitely keep track of those moments that you are getting that feedback because it it might not be all the time and your work matters. Like anytime a creator's putting something out, it, it really matters and it's important. So holding on to those positive moments is super impactful. And then with that, knowing how special it is to me when I get direct feedback and people reaching out to me, I really do try to take the time now that I felt it to reach out to other creators that I enjoy the work of, of even like last week I listened to a podcast and I was like, wow, that was super good moving on. And then the thought occurred to me, I should actually reach out to that person and tell them I really enjoyed it. So I found them on LinkedIn, I connected with them and told them, and now I have a new connection in my network. So it was mutually beneficial, but it really stemmed from 
I should actually tell that person that I really enjoyed their content and what they're creating. So it's just that feedback has actually impacted my own behavior to really let people know whether it's as simple as like, hey, I'm going to like that photo you posted on social media or comment or physically telling them. Um, yeah, it's really impacted me in so many positive ways. So I really hope to do that for other creators as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can uh, add something to that, that, that I really appreciated what you brought up there, Abby. Um, so um, I think for me, um, I, I can't agree with you more about, um, you know, we all go through those uncertain times when we're like questioning, what am I doing? It's like, is this making any difference? And um, so to hear hear from people, um, it's, it is really meaningful. I, I think another thing I could add to what Abby just presented is that when we um, are with a friend or, or someone um, that we've just met and they comment on, wow, you know, did you see that film or did you, did you notice that, that artwork down you know, that mural down the street and uh, um, that it's really our obligation as as artists to encourage that person to write a letter. And it may not be to the artist, but you know, you can write a letter to the editor of the newspaper or just to the newspaper, right? And say, hey, um, I was walk, going for a walk the other day and I saw this really amazing mural. And I just want to thank the city of Phoenix or the city of Surprise or whoever for uh, encouraging these kind of projects in our neighborhoods. The reason that that's so important is because it's the angry people that Bobby referenced earlier. They're the ones that will sit down and actually c compose a really mean letter. And uh, so the problem with that is that the cities, those public art programs or whoever it's directed to, they freak out. They forget their own composure. I don't know, Bobby, what your experience has been, but, um, or, any, or the rest of you, but they they freak out and they like sometimes have a knee jerk reaction that then becomes um, thrown back into the artist's lap before they even think about it. Like, well, who was this person? What is it that they're actually upset about? You know, and they they come up with you know not what I would call a solution, but just they're trying to um, uh, what would you call that? Um, you know, they want to um, not ignore it, but they want to squash it. You know, they want to just get rid of it as quickly as they can. Um, and it, it really is, is a detriment to the neighborhood, to the project as a whole. Um, and um, you know, I think that that's why it's so, so critical to get those, to encourage other people to write positive letters if, if in fact they had a really positive response. And most people do, that's the thing, is I've had far more positive feedback on projects that I've done in the public realm than I've had negative, but those people don't write. They just, oh, it was beautiful. Oh, that's such a great project. But, you know, writing that letter is just critical. So I think it behooves us all to think about that and encourage other people besides what you did, Abby, was so important. You sat down and you you connected with that person and you let them know, you know, the impact, the positive impact it had on you. Thank you. And Teresa, I see you have your hand up. I'll go ahead and unmute you. Let me actually. Oh, Teresa, let me try to. Oh, Sorry. there you go. So I went to a discussion uh, and I'll see it. Okay, Phoenix. 
I went to this discussion with the arts organization in the city of Phoenix, and that's exactly what they said, that it is the people who have something negative to say that take the time to, to uh, you know, send letters or show up at the meetings. And if you like something, then say something. I almost want to say that that's exactly what they said. Write a letter to your councilman, write a letter to them. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share that I heard that from the horse's mouth. I'm gonna yes, mute myself. You. Okay, thank you. I just wanna add to that, that don't underestimate how important those positive letters are to council people. Um, because they get, their responsibilities are enormous too, and they don't always have the opportunity to stay up on things. And it might even get them to go check that piece of, you know, public art out or go to the park and see what that letter was all about. Um, and I think that it's important to thank the cities for even having public art projects right funding for public art in the communities um and those letters of encouragement um you know really inspire them oh we i didn't know if anybody noticed you know and and then they, they may even present it at a council meeting you know they got five letters about this one project and one of the council people or maybe the mayor of that uh uh, city reads it um, and it's it becomes part of public record so it 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 can be very powerful most of the time when I'm presenting to the community um, it's pretty funny like uh, the light rail project in Tempe Right, uh, there's four different artists, four different sections on the light rail. Uh, and also the people designing light rail were also presenting. So like one half of the conference room was a giant map of Tempe where the train goes. And then uh, we all had like 12 boards up on the other side, right? And the only community members, like afterwards informally, lots of people came up and said congratulations, but it was just the Mill Avenue District's Business Association lawyer who was upset that the that Mill Avenue was going to be tore up for three years to build the train. Yeah. He was controlling the whole conversation. Right. It, it nothing to do with the art, nothing to do with all about just like literally the pissed off neighbors that hired somebody to go be a professional pissy person for them. <laughs> In the uh and it's it's interesting because you kind of expect it every time. Um, the Maryville project, there was one particular woman who hated her neighbors and she was just going to hate her neighbors. Um, and then uh, actually uh, for 32nd, a couple months ago, that project was hilarious because I guess Airbnbs are a huge problem up there. Didn't know that. So there was like 80 people in the room as opposed to, a nor I would say normally you, you'd be lucky if you got 12, right? Um, but they spent an hour complaining about the Airbnbs and then they all left. <laughs> by the time I, by the time I was done, there was only like 15 people. Left. <laughs> wow. Uh, anyway, that's normally how those things go. Any other stories of kind of audience interaction or participation in a finished work? Well, I guess um, I'll just kind of repeat something that both um, Diane and I brought up, and it's it's that in the schools, when you do art with the students, no matter what age, um, uh, it's it's pretty remarkable um, what a change art and art uh, the big art. So it could be music, dance, you know, visual um you know video interactive you know uh 
earth materials, any any of the creative, you know, processes that we love to explore. Um, even doing podcasts with the children and having them interview each other is is pretty cool. Um, but the bottom line is really the power of art to um, instill a sense of um, that I am somebody. And art is the best mechanism that I have seen. I mean, how else do you get grades to, uh, you know, the um, the uh, testing scores to improve that much in such a short period of time? Right. I mean, it's getting the kids out in the garden and taking their classes out in the garden and you and uh, you know, learning about color and learning about biology, learning about texture, what that means and um, companion planting and what that means, um, getting along through understanding how plants get along, um, composition with colors, um, so, so many uh, different aspects of the creative process. Um, I, I just have not yet found any other um, tool or uh, process that even comes close to uh, what the arts can do for community. Thank you, Joan. And that brings us into um, the benefits of collaboration, which we've definitely touched on. Um, but what are some like skills that you've learned from other collaborators that you've kind of taken with you? Like, what have you learned from other creatives who were That's working with you on a project that had you know, a different skill than you or skills that you shared? I think in collaborating with others, I've learned more about myself. Um, because it's challenging. It's it's a give and take, it's a, you know, stepping back, stepping in, learning how to do, how to not do. So I think I've gotten to know myself better through collaboration, um, apart from, you know, material skills, which are, yeah, great, um, but I'm more fascinating in growing. And so I could say that I've, I've learned more about how I work and how I can improve. I'm constantly challenging, you know, myself, myself to do better, um, observing how um, it went and now how it could be done for the future collaboration. Um, that's what I can think of for now. Here. Yeah. And any other, oh, and I mean, to continue with how it's benefited, if, you know, back to the questionnaire, uh, have I learned new skills? What are other ways in collaboration has benefited is it's just the meaningful connections, meaningful relationships that you build. And I think that's benefited me as just a human being overall. Um, just the meaningful, impactful, connections that were built. Um, Diana brought up one good point. Uh, when not to act is interest is an interesting one. Um, Cause you normally get, you normally get like when I was starting and I got my first big project was, was about light rail, right? I wanted to go big and colorful, right? And I had to actually redraw like three times for this one station before the project manager was like, Bobby, you cannot put something that looks like it's meant to be climbed on in the middle of the street. And I was like, wow, that, <laughs> because I don't think of it, you know, I don't think of my work as actually something that's meant to be climbed on all the time, you know? Uh, but it's interesting uh, getting other perspectives on your aesthetics and that sort of stuff. To make sure that you are doing appropriate things in appropriate places is a is a reasonable, very reasonable thing. Uh, 
I'll throw out that um, with, through every collaboration I've ever been a part of, like with the podcast, for example, like I always say I learn something new every single episode I ever record. Um, and I think that comes from just being curious. So I would, I, my piece of advice for a creator who wants learning and new skills from collaborations is really being curious and look like you maybe even broadening your idea of what a collaboration is like I think even this panel for example us being all in this together like some sort of collaboration here like where we can learn from each other and exchange ideas so I think just really identifying those opportunities and me looking at things through like a curiosity lens has really helped me grow and even very like small things from like just different skills uh, editing the show or even just like oh wow like they sounded like that was such an interesting way to think about something like that's a new way to think about something so maybe you not even like a hard skill but yeah i think coming through it with like a curiosity mindset through any collaboration can help you gain new skills and i know that's definitely been the case for me uh yeah i'll play off on that one abby um i think the curiosity thing for me ties in with the, how complex we humans are you know, which is full of these situations that have happened to us. Many, many of them, not something that we would choose um, and therefore don't even know how to deal with them. And so something that might get said or not said um, can trigger something in that person. Um, so I guess, being curious about who that person is and seeing them like one at a time. It's a lot of work, but when you put on that public art hat, for sure, you have to really consider all that. And um, at, at least in my experience, um, I've, I've observed that sometimes I feel like a, a, almost like a, a therapist because you have to, be patient and you have to take time to really, you know, uh, show the person that you really value what they have to say, even though you wish, like I know Bobby would laugh at this. I mean, even though you, you know, you wish that you just didn't have to deal with all that, but you know, when you have a room full of, of individuals, uh, that, generally speaking, have very complex stories, right? Lives, things that have happened to them beyond their control. Um, you, you have to really keep that in mind. So I guess I would play off on that curiosity piece um, that you mentioned, Abby, by, um, you know, give, give everyone a chance to, to be, be, be seen. I want to add to that. That was beautifully said. Everything's, um, sorry, playing off the giving everyone a chance. I think something to keep in mind in collaborations too, that not everyone's going to give us a chance and that we will be misunderstood or we won't be liked. And that's part of collaboration. And we still have to, you know, keep going with a hopefully good mindset or positive mindset and keep your focus on the outcome and that's it or well, there's more but that's it for me <laughs> and I just want to make sure before I ask my final question if there's any um, questions from our attendees that they'd like to um, put forward or any comments and keep in mind, you can always put it in the chat box too. That's Teresa. I can uh, definitely say as uh, Diane was speaking and talking about the growth that occurred through collaboration and the two entrepreneurial ventures that I did, I did collaborate with my husband, who I'm still married to, despite <laughs> the fact that we worked together. <laughs> but the first collaboration 
I felt at some point we had to decide, I felt like I had to decide between the, the marriage because it was just so intense. It was just the two of us, you know, working together. So I felt like I had to decide between the marriage or the project and I, I chose the marriage at that time. And then the later on when we came together again, um, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, it's it, we probably did another project together maybe seven years later. So I felt like we were different people. We had learned something from the uh, first time. And, and, and the second project actually was uh, better and we didn't we did I did not feel like I had to choose actually but the way we uh, stopped doing that project just had to do with life so we're not working together this third one that I'm working on I'm doing a greeting cards and by choice I want to I don't want a collaborator I don't want to work with him I don't want to work with anybody else just at this moment because the first two times was so much flexibility and so much give and take and so much choosing, you know, when to kind of step back. And I do believe that I learned the most from being in those two situations. When I came into this meeting, it, I knew I was not thinking about collaborating and I did not fit into the collaborative thing, but something said to me, and this goes to the curiosity um, component that Abby said, something said to me, okay, you, you're not considering collaborating. You don't even have anybody that you want to work with, but listening to others, um, who who are doing something of what you're doing in the arts or entrepreneurial or whatever it it was i was coming emotionally collaborative emotionally open even though i knew i was not in the same you know area of saying yes i'm going to collaborate but i allowed for myself to go okay universe you know, what do you got? And I got two pages of notes. <laughs> awesome. I got a lot of good notes out of this. And it was Abby who I think succinctly, like when uh, Diane talked about the growth, I, I said, yep, that's the absolute truth, right? Because it can't be my way or the highway. I really have to, and, and the best work came out of that. Um, but when Abby said, you know, somewhere we're a little bit vicariously collaborating in this group, that that's what I came to do. And that's exactly what occurred. <laughs> nice. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Teresa. Oh. Okay. And lastly, I have to ask. Since I work in a library, <laughs> what are some good book recommendations that you have that you're currently reading? Some old oh favorites my. that have helped you on your creative path. And I'll make sure that the library has them in our catalog. Uh -huh. Well, the ones I can think off the top of my head um, to help me stay present, for example, The Power of Now or The Four Agreements. And then I have other ones like Atomic Habits or Harmonic Wealth to help me like stay focused on <laughs> my journey. Uh, what else? I guess four is good enough. <laughs> uh, thank you. Anything by uh, Jeremy Rifkin. He's uh, a brilliant economist and he really knows how to explain what's going on right now in a very succinct and uh, understandable manner, which is a very difficult task. Um, and he, he, he's all over YouTube. The other one, uh, would be anything that Paul Stemetz has written. He is, uh, um, 
a researcher, a mycologist, and exploring all the the world of fungi and mushrooms and all of the medicinal benefits um, going on in that uh, amazing world. Um, connected to that would be Mike, anything Michael Pollan has written. Um, another brilliant author who's an explorer uh, and uh, puts himself in to the uh, seat of, well, I, I need to understand this first before I can write about it, um, which I think is really cool. Um, uh, so many things. Um, Substance of Stars is a new one. That's uh, a book that was published for the current show at the Heard Museum. It's a stunning book um, exploring the the um, relationship of the cosmos for many of uh, our Native American family. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, so that's a start. Thank you. I love this. And I, I don't know if you saw, but when you asked for book recs, I was like cheery because yeah. I love this topic. <laughs> um, so a few, a few things that come to mind. Um, in more of like the entrepreneurial inspiration side, I love Shoe Dog, Phil Knight's memoir about creating Nike, one of the most inspirational books I've ever read. And really kind of, at least for me, it gave me perspective on building something as big as Nike does not happen overnight. It talks about him literally like they're using waffle irons to make the bottoms of shoes. And it's just so inspiring. So I love that book. And it really just opened my eyes to like the entrepreneurial journey in whatever industry you're in is going to be long and it's no one's an overnight success um, but you can build big things and have impact along the way and then along with that in that same space is the best advice I ever got by Katie Couric she did a collection of essays with different notable people on just the best advice they ever got and it's really good some of them are really short some of them are long really good and then as somebody who is a creator, I personally have to have my mind wander and have a more creative space. So I can't just have all that entrepreneurial inspiration all the time. It's great, but I need a break. So I love Sarah J. Moss. She does the Court of Thorns and Roses series. If you love like fantasy, you're gonna wanna give your mind more of like that fiction break. I would definitely recommend her. I think Heather likes that one. <laughs> I see the emojis down there. And Bobby. I actually read a lot of biographies. Um, when I'm talking to younger creative people, I normally bring up Vonnegut or Tolkien um, or uh, Mark Twain. All of those men, uh, you would not believe what they went through. Vonnegut is insane. Like, absolutely, you totally understand his writings as something completely different. It is crazy. Um, there's also an art historian by the name of Hayden Herrera who does biographical stuff. Um, she's more contemporary. And so um, her Noguchi biography is super in depth um, and uh, brings up lots of things that aren't in the other Noguchi biographies that I've uh, read. Um, and then, of course, like I normally, it sounds like everybody else also finds an author like Krakauer. You can read Krakauer in like under six days, the entire collection, right? Like <laughs> Into Thin, Thin Air is a one night book. It is so riveting. <laughs> um, but yeah, also, to, I mean, Tolkien's biography, there's lots of idioms. Like in the visual arts, we don't have a lot of first person sources to talk about creativity. Right and authorship because like we're not writers we're visual people, and so generally the authors are the ones who are uh, articulating the creativity aspect. Um, way more succinctly than you know anybody can with a can of paint. <laughs> um, and then actually my. Uh, my beach read uh, these days is actually Jack Reacher. Novels so. Wonderful, thank you. I also, there's, I wanna bring up the difference in consumption. 
right? Uh, because in the studio, when I'm executing laborious work that have my hands tied, I listen to books, right? Which is very different. And that's like, you're gonna listen to uh, Lord of the Rings, right? Because it's really long. And it's, uh, I don't like the ones that are, uh, have multiple characters that it's all just monotone because I'm doing the same thing for months on end sometimes. And so I want consistency Right, as opposed to if you want uh, to be thinking in a dynamic fashion, like the three minute pop song is fine, you know. Uh, anyway, that's just on reading. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Thank you. And Heather, did you have a recommendation? Did you have your hand up? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Abby, Bobby, Joe, and Diana. Uh, I think we had a wonderful conversation and I really appreciate you spending your evening with us and everyone who attended. Um, hope you found it beneficial. Uh, please remember to check out our other programs for creative entrepreneurs going on this month, as well as all that the library offers. So again, thank you and I wish you all a great night. Thank you. Thank you.